Now, when we look at ore deposits, there are many, many different types of ore deposits. In fact, if you uh, decide to study geology, you might take an entire semester-long class just on different ore deposit types. So obviously, I can't cover them all in this lecture. So what I've done is chosen a sampling of different kinds of ore deposits. Uh, so you kind of get a flavor for the fact that they form in all kinds of different ways and um, create all kinds of different valuable minerals. But by all means, this is not every ore deposit out there. Uh, and we're going to start with the ones that are igneous ore deposits. In this case, the ore, the valuable material we are getting out of the ground, is an igneous rock. Remember, igneous rocks begin molten and then they cool and become solid. We're going to begin with what's called a layered igneous intrusion. And this forms from fractional crystallization. Okay, so first of all, remember, um, igneous rock forms deep underground and then it rises towards the surface. And of course, if it erupts at the surface, we have a volcano. But sometimes these bodies of igneous rock don't make it to the surface and they cool and they become solid underground, that's an igneous intrusion. So this is going to be my igneous intrusion here. Now, to make it a layered igneous intrusion, what happens as this magma is cooling down, it's going to reach a point where a certain mineral is going to start crystallizing. So now we have this red mineral and liquid in there. Well, that red mineral is going to sink and form a layer of that red mineral. So now we have a layer of cooled material and then liquid left over. And as that liquid rock cools down some more, then maybe we're going to have this purple mineral forming, right? So now it's purple mineral and liquid. And this is going to sink, and we're going to get a layer made from that material. And that will continue until all of the magma has cooled and become solid. And that's why it's a layered igneous intrusion. It has these very distinctive different layers uh, within it. Now, not all igneous intrusions cool that way. You need you know, the, the perfect composition and the, the perfect conditions for that to happen. But if it does, well, then we get some very important minerals. We get uh, chromite will form in these layered igneous intrusions, but we also get those PGEs, those platinum group elements, and that's platinum, palladium, osmium, and other minerals, uh, elements that act in similar ways. And, um, this is the point where I usually ask you guys, do, do any of you own some platinum? And maybe one person will raise their hand or so. But in truth, all of you guys have some platinum. Um, while platinum, because it's a shiny metal, is used in jewelry, um, its most common use is as a catalyst. A catalyst is something that uh, helps a chemical reaction occur, and in your cars, Every car has some platinum in it in the catalytic converter. The catalytic converter um, makes the exhaust gases cleaner, and the catalyst in there is platinum. Um, these pl platinum as a catalyst is also used quite a bit at uh, oil refineries as a catalyst for some of the refining processes. So anyway, a good example of one of these layered igneous intrusions is the Bushveld complex in South Africa. And that's what we're seeing right here. Notice we have a distinctive layer down here. Then we have the black mineral forming. And as the black mineral stops forming, the white mineral starts forming. So we end up having these very distinctive compositional layers in there. All right, another type of igneous ore deposit that we get is something called a pegmatite. A pegmatite is the last part of an igneous intrusion to cool. And because of that, it can be enriched in incompatible elements. And uh, what incompatible elements are, they're things like lithium, zirconium, beryllium, rare earth elements. and um, 
they're incompatible because they don't tend to like to um, bond with other things in a crystalline structure. Uh, so they like to stay in the liquid form. And it might be because they have a weird charge or they have, um, uh, or they're kind of big so they don't fit into a crystal structure as well or something like that. But in any case, uh, they like to stay in the liquid and that's why in the pegmatite, the last part of this liquid rock to cool, that's why they can get concentrated in there because they're kind of antisocial. They hang out there until that last part to cool cools and then they are forced to bond and forced to uh, um, form minerals. Um, so we also, in pegmatites, we often get micas and we get gemstones. Um, beryl, uh, while you might not know of beryl as a gemstone, if beryl is gem quality and blue, it is aquamarine. If it is gem quality and green, it is uh, emerald. And so we get some of these sorts of gemstones in pegmatites. And a nice example of a pegmatite is the Harding pegmatite in New Mexico. Uh, this is what a pegmatite can look like. In addition to having those, those um, uh, incompatible elements that don't like bonding with each other and stuff, you, pegmatites are also noted for big crystals. And here's the top of my hammer. This is a feldspar crystal. And some of the feldspar crystals there at, at the Harding pegmatite are like uh, 10 or 15 feet long. Uh, so there are some really big crystals there. All right, another igneous ore deposit that we have is a kimberlite. And kimberlites are very extraordinary because the magma that makes the kimberlite forms very deep. It forms 150 to 400 kilometers deep. So it forms quite deep in, in, the, uh, in the Earth's, um, uh, compared to other magmas. And it also travels to the surface very, very quickly. 10 to 100 kilometers an hour, it'll go from 400 kilometers deep all the way to the Earth's surface. And what makes these things special is as they travel upwards, they can pick up hitchhikers. And those hitchhikers happen to be diamonds. And so um, we can get uh, diamonds found in these kimberlites. And a great example of one of these is Kimberly in South Africa, but uh, this one is a kimberlite that's closer to home, and uh, this is a Lake Ellen kimberlite in Michigan. And if we look closely, this is what the kimberlite looks like. It's actually a volcanic breccia. And uh, now why it picks up diamonds, some areas in the mantle, in the Earth's mantle, have enough carbon, because diamonds are pure carbon. Some areas in, uh, in the Earth's mantle have enough carbon, and they have the right temperature and right pressure conditions that diamonds will form there. And so this magma will rise from deep underground through one of these diamond-bearing areas of the mantle and bring those diamonds to the surface. But that doesn't always happen. Sometimes you get a kimberlite rising to the surface and it doesn't go through one of those diamond bearing areas and so you don't get any diamonds in there. Um, just so you guys know, uh, diamonds are seriously not all that rare. That's, that's an entire scam. Um, uh, a good emerald is a lot harder to find than uh, a good diamond. All right, last of the igneous ore deposits that I want to go over are just plain old igneous intrusions, these bodies of igneous rock that cool underground. And so it might be something like granite or gabbro or so on. And um, uh, what makes these things special is some of them look really nice and they don't have a lot of fractures in them, which means they can be dimension stones. And dimension stone is basically where you cut the granite or gabbro or igneous rock into specific um, sizes. So you can go and you can be like, I want a piece that's two feet by three feet by nine feet and it will get cut that way and polished for you. 
And what we then do with this is you can uh, build things out of it. Uh, the state capitol building in Texas is made from granite that was mined in Texas. You can also make uh, monuments like uh, headstones and other uh, um, sorts of monuments from this. And the reason you want it to look nice is you don't want a building to be looking ugly and you don't want a lot of fractures in it because it needs to be nice and strong and you need to be able to cut it without it breaking into all kinds of pieces. This is um, uh, Granite Quarry in Marble Falls, Texas. In fact, that is the quarry where granite was extracted to build the state capitol building. Uh, notice that they don't blast the granite out here, they actually cut it out, right? Blasting would put too many cracks in it. So they have uh, special cutting tools uh, that basically just cut blocks of granite out of there. All right, so those were the igneous ore deposits where the thing we're getting out of the ground is igneous rock. But there are other ways that um, ore deposits form. And uh, hot water creates a lot of ore deposits. And we call these hydrothermal ore deposits. Hydro meaning water, thermal referring to the heat. And so in this case, the ore minerals are precipitated by hot water. So think about this, um, hot water holds more material in solution than cold water does. And so as this hot water is circulating underground and it moves away from a heat source and starts cooling off, the minerals that were dissolved in that hot water will precipitate out and um, create these, uh, these hydrothermal ore deposits. Now, where the hot water comes from, there's two basic places. So let's take a look. We have Earth's surface up here, and we have these magma chambers down there, right? That's, that's um, uh, this igneous rock that's liquid, it's molten, sitting underground. And one source of hot water is juvenile water, or what we call magmatic water. And in this case, remember back in volcanoes, I said that all magma has dissolved gases in it that includes water vapor. As this thing cools down and becomes solid, the water that was stuck in there is gonna be driven out into the rocks surrounding it. That's going to be your juvenile water, or like I said, magmatic water. Now, the other place we get this hot water from is circulating groundwater. So let's imagine, right, we have it rain here, some of that water infiltrates into the groundwater, it gets closer to this magma body, it gets heated up, and so we have this groundwater kind of circulating close to that hot magma chamber, and that's our other source of hot water. So their sources of hot water either are the igneous intrusion itself or groundwater circulating around that igneous intrusion. Now, we have a few different types of hydrothermal ore deposits. We have what are known as vein deposits. And a vein is a tabular body of minerals in rock. And what tabular means is like a book. So it's going to be thin in one direction and it's going to be longer in the other directions. And so that's what tabular means. It just refers to the shape of this thing. And uh, we can have what are called epithermal vein deposits. These form relatively close to Earth's surface, usually less than 1,500 meters deep. And these are usually going to be near volcanic centers uh, because it's that, that uh, magma under the volcanoes that's providing the heat for our water. Uh, the water is going to be about 50 to 200 degrees Celsius, and you might be like, how do we get liquid water that's hotter than the boiling point? Well, that's because um, 
underground, it's under pressure, and that pressure raises the, uh, the boiling point, basically. So water is going to be 50 to 200 degrees Celsius. Typical things we get from this are going to be gold and silver. A nice example of one of these um, uh, deposits is at the Martha Mine in New Zealand. And right there you can see one of the veins in the Martha Mine. Now we can also have what are called mesothermal deposits, mesothermal vein deposits. These form deeper underground. And usually you find these along major regional faults that you get when you have mountains being formed. And we are deeper, the water tends to be hotter, two to 300 degrees Celsius. Uh, again, this forms gold, but sometimes also some silver and base metals. And a great example of one of these is Val d'Or in Quebec. And I love the name Val d'Or because that means Valley of Gold. But hot water doesn't have to form a vein where the minerals are um, uh, confined to this, this tabular area. You might get what are called disseminated deposits, which are also called porphyry deposits. I like the name disseminated because it describes them. If something is disseminated, it is scattered, it's spread out. And that's exactly what goes on in this. The ore minerals are scattered along all kinds of tiny fractures in a large body of rock. And these usually form from um, fluids that are at the top of a cooling magma chamber. So imagine that magma body is cooling down and all that water is being driven off that magma body into the uh, surrounding rocks. And this usually happens about one to five kilometers deep. And things we can get from these, we get a lot of copper from these disseminated deposits, but we also can get things like molybdenum and gold. And a great example of one of these is Bingham Canyon in Utah. This is some ore of a disseminated gold deposit. You're not going to be able to see any of the individual like little atoms and stuff of gold because it is disseminated and they're tiny, they're microscopic in there. This is Bingham Canyon. Bingham Canyon is sort of the largest open pit mine in the world. It's about two and a half miles across and three quarters of a mile deep. Uh, my dad worked there for a while, but anyway. Um, so it's, um, um, I said it's sort of the largest open pit mine because there are two that are equally as large, um, Escondida in Chile and Morenci in Arizona. So they're both really big uh, and comparable to this one. All right, other hydrothermal ore deposits include volcanogenic massive sulfides. That's a mouthful to say, so we just call these VMS deposits. And these are created under the oceans, uh, where you have these underwater uh, hot springs that we call black smokers. And this is a black smoker. There's all kinds of this dark stuff coming out of it. Um, and it looks like smoke, but it's actually um, very hot water. And the reason it's all black and smoky looking is because it's so enriched in minerals. So what happens is we have under the oceans these areas called the mid-ocean ridges, which are volcanic mountain ranges. And so we have this magma under um, uh, in the ocean crust, and that's our heat source. And then we have, remember, um, the rocks are not absolutely perfectly solid. There's cracks and things in them. So the seawater can kind of seep into the rocks. It gets closer to that heat source and it gets heated up. And when that water gets heated up, it starts dissolving things like metals out of the basalt and sulfur because, you know, this is volcanic. Sulfur is quite um, uh, uh, important there. And, um, and so then this hot water rises, comes out uh, on the sea floor as one of these black smoker hot springs. But of course now it's going into the cold ocean water, so that hot water is going to cool down and all of those metals and sulfur that were in that hot water dissolved are going to precipitate out and cover the sea floor. 
And here's some um, uh, part of a uh, black smoker deposit, part of a uh, VMS deposit, and we see it, it actually says um, uh, folded ore with quartz and pyrite. Um, but in any case, this kind of golden colored stuff is pyrite, which is iron sulfide, uh, which is, uh, again, volcanogenic massive sulfide, we get sulfide minerals, which are metals bonded to sulfur. And that's what some of the ore would look like there. So one thing that mining companies love about these types of uh, um, VMS deposits is they tend to be polymetallic. It means you get a whole lot of different enriched elements in there. So you might get copper, zinc, lead, silver, gold, uh, all in that ore. So these can be very rich ore deposits to mine. And a good example of one of them is Kid Creek in Ontario. Put it off there.